Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this evening's live stream presentation. My name is John. I am the Tattooed Historian. And it's so great to be back on once again with my great friend, the cheese to my cracker, Pete Carmichael, director of the Civil War Institute at Gaysburg College. Pete, how are you, my friend? John, you uh, outdid yourself. And of course, uh, as we've already told Lindsay, uh, this is our last show for the summer, which we had intended, of course, uh, to call it quits at the end of, end of June. And uh, how long were you working up this intro? Or it just comes naturally to you. It, I, I grew up on Don Rickles. So <laughs> Don Rickles and British comedy. So yeah. it's like I have this dry, weird humor. So yeah, it was either that or the Abbot to my Costello. So, yeah. I like that one as well. Okay. Like I'll use yeah. that for next time. Yeah. What about what about Benny Hill? Did you like Benny Hill growing oh, up? Oh, I love Benny Hill. Yeah. yeah. Benny Hill was great. Yeah. Yeah. I showed my girls um, a little bit of Monty Python. Oh yeah. It yeah, it didn't land at all. Didn't? They left uh, for about, about 10 minutes. <laughs> they missed that great scene where King Arthur comes up to the knight who's he's King Arthur cuts off his arm, Brian uh -huh. cuts off all of his arms and his legs, and yeah, continues to try to resist. <laughs> they missed that. I think they maybe they would have pivoted. The girls would have, but they just stayed to see that scene. No, yeah, maybe <laughs> we'll never know. Never know. <laughs> That's right. Well, Lindsay Privet is our last guest again for the summer. John and I will come back when the semester resumes, which is going to resume for me in, in August, mm -hmm. and I'm thrilled to have. Lindsay on the show, uh, one because of her scholarship, but also because of her background. Uh, Lindsay and I had a conversation, I think maybe into May, I believe, and we talked about a range of things to discover that Lindsay, uh, like myself, that we uh, got our start in the National Park Service. Uh, Lindsay, you probably won't be surprised where, at Vicksburg, where she was a summer seasonal. And how many summers were you at? Uh, I think I did about seven. Wow. So wow. Seven or eight. It was, there's yeah. quite a few. Yeah. 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 I did about that many as well at three different Virginia parks. And Lindsay and I talked about all the joys and challenges of public history. And we're certainly going to get to that mm -hmm. in just a moment. I'm going to tell our audiences a little bit more about Lindsay. Uh, Lindsay's undergraduate degree is at, from Baylor University, mm -hmm. uh, where she studied under. Michael Parrish. Uh, Michael Parrish is the series editor uh, for the uh, LSU uh, Civil War series. What is it? I should know that off the top of my head. Divided conflicts. Oh my God, yeah. that's embarrassing. Is that right? <laughs> I think so. I think so. I think so. Okay, is it, right? So she worked uh, with Michael Parrish at Baylor, did U.S. history. Did you do public history there as well? Baylor? Just, just U.S. Just straight up history, old fashioned history. Okay. Old fashioned history. Oh, yeah. I, I went with the intention of doing museum studies, yeah. um, but decided to just cast my lot with yeah. history. With, yeah. yeah. All right. And then from there, uh, Lindsay ventured off to the University of Alabama, uh, where she worked with George Rabel, uh, who's one of my favorite historians. I, mm -hmm. George Rabel has done books on a wide variety of topics. His first book to be on violence and reconstruction. His most recent book, well, he did a, this, a series of lectures for LSU. Mm -hmm. I don't know the title off the top of my head, but it's an interesting book on how Southerners imagined, in essence, imagined the Yankee race. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Fleming lectures that, uh, that George gave there. And that's, a, that's an excellent book. But Rabel also did a fantastic book on Fredericksburg, Confederate Republic, on Confederate women at war. Okay. And rumor has it that he's working on George B. McCollin. Uh, but uh, mm. Rabel is, uh, he plays it pretty close to the vest. So I think, <laughs> but I'm not, not exactly sure. And so from uh, the University of Alabama, uh, Lindsay has gone on to Anderson University in South Carolina, close to Spartanburg. I can't remember now. Yeah, we're about Spartanburg's on the other side of Greenville, so maybe hour, hour and a half. Okay, all right. So it's up country, South Carolina. Yeah, that's, that's a better description, I think. Yeah. And there, Lindsay teaches again a range of courses: U.S. history, um, Gilded Age, Civil War, and a little bit of public history. You teach as well. And I do. I do. I do uh, some public history. Um, I have a a class on uh, memory. 
right. um, and how memory has has been shaped. And that's, I think, proving to be one that students <laughs> really enjoy, especially given our, our current yeah, climate that we're in. It'll be coming in, in mass, uh, hopefully, this semester for that class. Mm -hmm. So, Lindy, uh, you know, because you're talking to two historians, we do our homework, research, background check, if you want to call it. That. True. And, John, I've got some really good fun facts. Oh. Are you ready for the first fun fact, John? I'm always ready for fun facts. Do it. All right. Lindsay has visited every single state in the union. All 50. Wow. She's done it. Now, I'll ask, but I already know the answer, Lindsay. Your favorite state in the union, it has to be. There can be no other than the Hoosier State, the great state of Indiana. We've got the flatlands up north. We've got the hills down south. Yeah. you got whatever you want. you got the Indy 500. Uh, what, what is there not to like? That's my guess. John, what do you think is Lindsay's favorite state that she's visited? I would hope it's Pennsylvania. But, you know, I mean, we have we have whoopie pies. You know, we, 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 we have all kinds of great Revolutionary War and Civil War history. You know, I, I would hope. It would be Pennsylvania, but I have Philly uh, cheese steaks. Pardon? Yes. Well, yes. Philly cheese steaks. We have the Manny Brothers in Pittsburgh. You know. Yeah, but the problem is in Pennsylvania, you got to either cheer for the Eagles or for the Steelers, and that's just not palatable at all. So well, it's not palatable for me either. But I still, <laughs> I'm still here for right now. Um, all right, Lindsay. Here's a big drum roll. Tell us of all the 50 states you have visited, mm -hmm. what's your favorite one? Oh, goodness. I don't even know. They're all so different and wonderful. I will tell you that the surprise, the surprise, one of my favorites that I don't think I would have anticipated uh, when we visited was Idaho. Oh, Idaho hmm. is right. a beautiful, beautiful state. We took a driving vacation up next to, I think it's the Salmon River. Yeah. Um, going up to Big Hole National National Battlefield, yeah, and it's yeah. it's stunning, right. um, and that's one when you think of beautiful states. Idaho is not the first one that that comes to mind. So potatoes, that's what you think. Right. You think potatoes? That's exactly what you think. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Okay, so Idaho it is, and I should also note again as part of our background check, uh, <laughs> Lindsay. Uh, I would say. Introduction to historical sites was uh, with her father, right? Mm -hmm. And so I, I'm just, you know, curious. Now we're going to go Civil War. Your first Civil War site with dad and what stood out? Um, so I, I don't know if I, if it's the, the first one. So I grew up in Vicksburg. So I grew up all over that park. Um, but one of the one of the very strongest memories I have when I was a child, we would take these themed road trip vacations right. and like link battlefields together. Right. Right. Um, and I remember very clearly being probably about eight years old and we were at Manassas yeah. Yeah. and my dad and I were walking up this hill in the middle of like the July, right. you know, around the time the battle would have happened. Right. And I remember him turning to me and looking at me and being like, can you imagine trying to charge up this hill with a full wool uniform carrying a rifle with people shooting at you? <laughs> um, and for an eight year old, you know, it's one of those memories that just makes you realize where you are and where you're standing, right? Um, yeah. When, you know, uh, that moment in your youth when your imagination right is grabbed by a place uh, yes when, when your imagination right it sort of just it, 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 that it's so connected to that landscape and before you know it it's got a hold of you and mm -hmm. uh, like for you at uh, uh, at manassas as well mm -hmm. i'll sit on the, the public history angle here for just a little bit more and then john and i will will talk about your dissertation that you are now of course working into a full book manuscript your time at Vicksburg. Um, could you tell us a little bit about how that has shaped your thinking about being a teacher as well as a scholar? Yeah, I, so Vicksburg, I started my first se um, season at Vicksburg was the summer after I graduated high school. 
Um, and I very much started as the um, person who ran the desk and explained to people where the bathrooms were. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how I got my start. Um, but from there, I eventually graduated into being able to give battlefield talks um, to walking, walking the battlefield and riding through the battlefield and being able to do research. And by the end of my time, I was actually doing um, I was their education technician. So I was running all of their um, junior ranger yeah. summer yeah. camps and things like that. Yeah. Um, and. It's it's really interesting because when I teach my general education students, my freshmen and sophomores who just have to take US 1 and US 2, I see a lot of those visitors in them, right? right? Um, and so I noticed that for a lot of those, those kind of entry level classes, I tend to fall back on, on a lot of those storytelling techniques and those those techniques that you use to kind of try to make help help people make connections with items or people or events of the past. Um, so so it was it was probably a, a semester or two in before I realized that I was pulling from that public history background in the classroom. Um, and seeing seeing students kind of become engaged in similar ways. Mm -hmm. I was at um, Fredericksburg National Park two weeks ago to be part of a workshop about interpreting issues uh, of, of race uh, in light of what had happened in the last two and a half weeks after the murder of George Floyd. And one of the issues that we discussed, an, an issue that, as you well know, that we're all deeply uh, interested in or concerned about, and that is how do we bring uh, a more diverse audience to our civil war battlefields? And I'm curious, you know, being in Vicksburg, in which I, I believe I'm correct in saying that that the local population is, there's, I don't know if it's mostly African American, but it, there's significant numbers of African Americans, like Petersburg, Virginia. I mean, all around the National Park in Petersburg is is largely African American. Uh, so you've got a large black population in Vicksburg. What did you see over time there as to how that, how the population, uh, local population, interacted or engaged or was a part of, of what you all did at Vicksburg? I, I agree. At the time that I, I left, the diversity question was still something that they were they were kind of trying to struggle with yeah. and grapple with, with people who were kind of coming to the park and visiting the park. I know uh, with our junior ranger camp, we were beginning to begin initiatives of um, trying to bring in local community organizations to kind of have kids come in to get to participate during the day. The, the, the camp ran uh, Monday through Friday from I think 8 a.m. till noon. And it was, of course, National Park Service, it was completely free. We just needed needed to be able to help access, access yeah. children. Um, so a lot of the work that I, I saw specifically was going out into the community um, and uh, my, my computer just wanted to just wanted to do it do an update, so I had to, I had to make sure that I didn't hit the wrong button there. For a second. Um, to go out into the community, to go out into elementary schools, and and to meet individuals where they were um, and where they were at, and to tell some of these some of these stories. Yeah. You know, Lizzie, I, I you know I think that what you experienced and, and saw at Pittsburgh, uh, I mean, John and I could give you many other examples of similar efforts. Again, I'm not trying to suggest that there can't be more uh, should be done on that front. Mm -hmm. I think this is a time more than ever that we need to acknowledge and, and to some degree um, embrace the good work that many of your former colleagues at Vicksburg are continuing to do. I've uh, mentioned mm -hmm. Sanders here at Gettysburg and what she has done, and the list goes on and on. So. Uh, it's my hope that, you know, on these, again, I've spent a little bit too much time on Twitter this week. And uh, so uh, if I look a little haggard tonight, it is because of that. One of the things I'm just sort of struck by is that I, I don't understand why there isn't more on Twitter that 
is more celebratory and more positive and reaffirming. And I think that these are the kinds of things that you just described, Lindsay, is what there should be out there that people should, at the day of the, you know, acknowledge uh, so that we have a good sense of where we are uh, mm -hmm. uh, instead of just sort of knocking things down that we're not doing this, or we've never done this, which is just something not true. Uh, so it's good to hear that Vicksburg is working hard on that front to diversify uh, their audience. John, did you have any public history questions before we slide over to Lindsay's uh, book? I'm going to call it a book now, Lindsay. Is that okay? Where is your book? It's not your dissertation anymore, right? It is my book. It is your book. All right, that's good. So yeah. before we do your book, John, did you have anything to ask about public history before we go? Yeah, uh, Lindsay, I would like to know for those who are uh, watching and in the comment section and such who are thinking of diving into public history as far as going and trying to uh, get a summer maybe at a National Park Service or to at least understand what they need to do to get involved in uh, helping to change this, you know, uh, either a demographic shift or accessibility issues, et cetera. If there are students watching out there or even some of your students who may come to you and say, I would like to get involved in public history, what would you tell those students to do? Yeah, so and and I I even have students who are who are becoming really interested, you know, when we have this question of what what do we do with history and public history is a really great option for that. Um and one of the things I I direct them to is making themselves familiar with the uh sites of public history that are in their hometown, local museums, um, if they happen to live anywhere near archives, things like that, where, or, or tour homes, we have several tour homes here in the area, historical societies, things like that, um, that they could either have the opportunity, if not to, to get their feet wet in interning or working there, or simply volunteering, because many of these places are desperately, desperately in need of, of docents and, and people to just sometimes help keep the doors open. Um, and one of the things that I, I found that when I was at Vicksburg, um, just finding out about all the different jobs people were doing while I was there and asking if they minded if I helped. And it just blew open the opportunities of figuring out what I like to do, what wasn't really my thing, and then the ability to put on my resume, like, oh, I helped catalog artifacts with the museum curator or something along those lines. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that that, that that kind of getting your foot in and just kind of figuring out the, the lay of the land um, and I don't think that there are many people who are much nicer than public historians <laughs> to, to just say like, how I want your job, how do I become, how do I do this? There's tons of people who, who are willing to help and give advice and kind of tell their story to kind of help people figure out mm -hmm. um, how, how to do that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's very important to acknowledge that sometimes all you have to do is just ask. Mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes uh, uh, um, a lot of historians are introverts and they don't know how to ask. And sometimes you just have to be ready to hear no and hope for a yes that you mm -hmm. can help out. And I think that's one of the major roadblocks I see with a lot of students uh, that I have come into contact with. They just don't know that you can just ask. Mm -hmm. Ask someone needs help with this or whatever. So, yeah, I think that's very, very important to breaking down that barrier. Mm -hmm. All right. So... We'll talk about Lindsay, the scholar, since she uh, has not, as we're here, it's worth noting, that you've not left the public history uh, experiences behind you. Uh, one more example of where the fields of public history and academic history have come together. You're, again, a very good example of that. Uh, and now I can, we'll, we'll focus on your scholarship. The title, the working title, how can we say that? The working title of your book is Fighting Johnny's Fevers and Mosquitoes, A Medical History of the Vicksburg Campaign. Before we sort of drill down into Vicksburg, I'd like for you to just reflect upon what does it mean to bring a, a, an angle toward a military campaign that is uh, accounts for the medical history of it, right? Why does medicine matter when we study military history? That's what I'm trying to do. 
Well, so I think one of the things that's so, so very interesting, and this was something I, I think John and I were talking about before we got, we get, got started, is we're keenly aware of the victims of the war. We're keenly aware of the casualty lists, of the death and the dying and, and these processes and what it takes to put men back together and to heal them. Um, but we don't tend to focus on the importance of that. And what I mean by that is if you're sending men into battle, you theoretically need to have enough of them coming out of that battle to do it again the next day, right? And, and you need to be able to continuously keep an army that has enough strength and fighting effectiveness in order to be able to wage the war. And if you can't do that, then the army's not going to be successful. You're, you're going to lose the war. And, and the bulk of how you are going to do that is going to be at least in part rooted in the health of soldiers, in the medical care that they're receiving, and in the knowledge of um, the officers in the medical corps whose responsibility it is to take care of of these issues. Um, so it's one of, it's kind of that silent specter that's always there. These men are always laboring in the background. Anytime we talk about um, an army moving from this location to that location or participating in three days of battle at Gettysburg. Um, but we've, we rarely ever take a moment and focus on that process of what it takes to keep an army healthy and operational. Is it one reason why we've not given sufficient attention to the health of the rank and file of the soldiers is that in the battle reports and the soldier letters, could, could you talk to, talk to us about that written evidence that we as historians have relied so heavily upon to reconstruct campaign histories or battle narratives? I think that one of the things that, that comes out in your book, uh, is that the sources themselves from the soldiers and from the officers that they don't really tell the whole story right? mm -hmm. yeah yeah so what, what could you say to us about those sources what don't they say often that uh and, and then where did you have to where did you get the medical history from i guess is where I'm yeah yeah so i think one of the reasons why this hasn't been a main focus has been because I, I think we have a tendency to feel like we've known what the medical history of the war is, right? It's a bunch of sawbones who are like waiting at a tent, ready to like chop off people's legs and put them in piles. And and that that was kind of the, the narrative of what, what medicine was. And it just kind of swept through and has kind of really remained unchallenged until the past, you know, couple of decades. Um, and a lot of that kind of memory of medicine, a lot of that legacy is rooted in soldier letters. So when um, when authors would go to write about or historians would go to write about a campaign history or soldiers experiences in the field, they usually always included medical care and death and dying, um, but they're using soldiers letters to talk about those things. And soldiers have a very per, uh, specific perception of what's happening to them. They have a very kind of um, almost a bitterness at times of the way that the army is has control over their bodies, has authority over their bodies, is utilizing their bodies and has kind of taken that power away from them, that freedom that they're used to. And surgeons are just another example of that. Surgeons have the ability to decide if you're sick enough to uh, sit out for the day or if you're malingering and you have to go on night watch that night. Or they have the ability to decide if your leg is bad enough to come off and they're going to start dismantling your body or it's or if it's OK enough to that you'll make it like there's a lot of power that a surgeon has over a soldier's body. Um, and that's a very unsettling feeling. I think even today, when when we're sick, when we go to the hospital and we're interacting with, with doctors and physicians, the, the, the feeling that they have 
the ability to make decisions. They have knowledge of our bodies that we don't we don't have. We don't understand. It's a very kind of frightening thing to kind of navigate. Um, so when when soldiers write about the aftermath of their care, a lot of times they lay blame at the feet of surgeons who are engaged in these different professional kind of discourses about proper medical care, how you triage patients on the field, how you make those hard decisions about who you're going to treat next and who who you're going to leave there to let die. Um, soldiers have a very specific perception that doesn't kind of engage everything else that's going on in that moment. Right. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, I think it's, and that's well said, that the soldiers' resentment toward the military establishment as a whole, they mm -hmm. all channel it or target at a surgeon. He mm -hmm. is not responsible uh, for their entrapment. Although, as you also again point out, the immense power that a surgeon had and mm -hmm. I recall in Lee's army that he came to understand that too many surgeons had personal relationships with the soldiers that had existed prior to the war. And so, and I don't remember when this policy was enacted, but it made it uh, mandatory that Confederate doctors would have to be rotated from various hospitals so that that kind of uh, personal relationship or favoritism uh, would not result in either keeping a man in the hospital for too long or, or sending them home. But I think, again, it's, a, it's an excellent point for everyone to remember that the stereotype of the drunken butcher as yeah. the typical Civil War surgeon, it's uh, a lot of hostility. Yeah. Well, men who, who understandably felt that the system was rigged against them. And, uh, and, I, and I think, you know, you can understand where that anger came, came from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and one of the things I think that gets lost in that narrative, though, is what surgeons themselves then endure. Um, because in in seeing that story from the perspective of the soldier, we, we lose the surgeon's perspective of laboring among thousands of men who have been dismembered and mutilated, trying to make what decisions they could in the moment with limited help, limited access, sometimes after the sun has gone down under candlelight. Um, the the stereotype of, of that, that drunken butcher makes you pause and wonder, you know, th those of them who, who exhibited that behavior, why were they drunk, right? Um, what did they experience th themselves? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something that we we really don't think about is kind of like the trauma that these surgeons went through just as much as uh, not just as much because they're the bodies are being destroyed but but the men that are wounded mm -hmm. the surgeons are going through mental trauma as well because some of these surgeons never even seen a gunshot before they they were put on the field and and put into service uh i think it's really important lindsay for you to point out too uh, that how much how different your future uh of book is as far as the fact that uh, we've had previous works about surgeons who are kind of in an area where it was uh contained uh it wasn't a field hospital per se it wasn't in the you know in a place where there were shortages a lot there were there are instances where we see monographs and books where they are in uh hospitals and they're doing uh anatomical uh, studies in hospital environments, not in field hospital environments. Mm -hmm. Your work goes into uh, what it, what the conditions are like on the ground, as we would say, right in the mm -hmm. heart of everything. Can you go into how your book will fit, your future book will fit into uh, th that kind of a narrative? Yeah. So one of the things I envision is the, and, and I think the work that you're referencing is uh, Shauna Devine's Yes. Learning from the or she's the most notable one. Shauna Devine's Learning from the Wounded, which is an amazing book um, that that does look at um, surgeons and physicians who are using the Civil War as an opportunity to expand their medical knowledge in the middle of the 19th century. Um, and one of the things that I find really interesting is 
they're they're getting all of these specimens. They're getting autopsy reports from surgeons who are working in general hospitals, and they're they're collecting it all in D.C. for the intention of of building. Uh, the National Library of Health and Medicine, or what ends up becoming that. Um, and so you have this, this like higher set of surgeons who are operating in general hospitals and who are engaged in these kind of like professional conversations. Um, but for them to be able to do what they're doing, they also need to have conversations with the surgeons who are, who are in the field dealing with men who first um, who, as they come off of the field. And, what, and I'll give you an example of this. Um, the Battle of Chickasaw Bayou in December of 1862, it's, it's Grant's essentially his first effort to try to take Vicksburg, fails miserably. Um, but it is one of the first battles that is fought in the Western Hemisphere right after a handful of different reforms in terms of collecting and transporting and evacuating soldiers from the field have gone into place. It takes place about two days after Fredericks, two, three days after Fredericksburg. Um, and there is a man named Edmund Andrews who takes all of the records and, and says in the beginning that this is the first time a surgeon's been able to do this because until now, it's been too chaotic. You you have a man on the field, you put him you put him on a train and a wagon, and off he goes, and you never hear about him anymore. But he takes all of the records for all of the cases in his division, and he follows them and manages to figure out what happens to them up to twenty or thirty days out from from receiving their wounds, um, so that he could then trace the decisions that happened on the battlefield, what were the results, who had secondary hemorrhages, who had to have a secondary amputation, who died, and collate kind of all of that data. Um, and he, he was one of the field surgeons that, that, that does this. He's not one of the guys who's, who's operating in a giant general hospital. So it's that level of communication between the field and these, these higher hospitals that make it that that kind of makes the whole picture complete. Yeah, I want to. I wanna, before I get to Pete, real quick, I'll, I'll let Pete take over. Then, uh, shout out to uh, to Shawna Devine because she, Pete, is at the Shulish School of Medicine and Dentistry at Western University, where yeah. I will be going. Uh, so I'm sure we'll be able to possibly run into each other at some point uh, along the way. And that book is from the UNC Press. UNC Press, right. And it won uh, the Watson Brown Prize as mm -hmm. well. The distinguished oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, and it's pinned in the comments if anyone's interested in that as well. Yeah. So could you um, talk to us a little bit about actually what did surgeons learn uh, and and from Vicksburg or from another campaign that you might be uh, familiar with, Lindsay? Because what you're talking about or what you're describing is a professionalization of the American military establishment, and, and they and they learn it as you've just said uh, from broken bodies and also from from the dead. Uh, this is one of the photographs. I think it'll be fine to see from Charlotte book. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. right. And so um, these sort of living specimens, right? Um, and I assume that. Well, I know, I think almost for a fact, that these physicians were focused almost entirely on their physical bodies. I, I don't recall that they're asking about how these men were coping with the emotional fallout or emotional, what we would say, emotional trauma. So could you tell us, you know, what are these doctors learning and how does this help the medical establishment become mm -hmm. more professional? I think that that's one of the, the struggles with doing Civil War medicine. Um, and one of the reasons why not much more has been done with the exception of the past several decades is because the standard narrative is that they don't learn anything. Like there's no massive medical advancements the way you get when you come out of World War I, for example, when they figure out how to uh, perform blood transfusions in the field 
or the the cosmetic and the reconstructive surgery advancements that kind of come come out of that. Um, there's a handful of surgeons who who experiment with um, with antiseptics hmm. and who are kind of on the verge of figuring out. Um, how infection is being transmitted through hospitals and how uh, to sterilize and keep um, soldiers clean. Um, but one of the things is that that ends up happening toward the end of the war, right? So there's, it's, it would be, have been different if it happened in 1861 and then you have four, four or five years to kind of perfect what's going on. I think the biggest skill that they come out of learning the war with is learning just simply how to um, how to do these things while they're in the field. Does, if that makes if that makes sense. Yeah. So how to collect bodies for autopsy? How to how to collect these autopsy reports? How to codify these informations? Creating a place to keep all of this information. And for it to be able to be built upon and these specimens that, that they collect and things like that. And in terms of in terms of field care in the Met in the um, in the army, I think one of the greatest advancements that they that they figure out is how to have the army and the medical corps kind of coexist and help one another as they're trying to undertake things like campaigns, mm -hmm. these massive kind of movement of, of men. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of that bureaucratized yeah. sense. Yeah. Could you give us an example uh, of where you see the collaboration between a medical establishment that has now become incorporated into the military establishment and that they are working side by side? Mm -hmm. So one of the things, uh, and this is, one of the things that's that's great about studying Vicksburg because it, it comes right on the cusp of some of these changes. Uh, the I'll get I'll give Shiloh as an example. I, I think most people when they think of medical disasters, they think of Manassas, first Manassas, where evacuation just breaks down on the field, men are left in the sun for days. There are people with injuries who are like forced to walk back to DC, and it just becomes an overall kind of Kind of disaster. Um, something similar-ish kind of happens at Shiloh, uh, not to the same extent, but but as the Union Army is kind of like being pushed up against Pittsburgh Landing, um, state governors send ships to go and get their men because the assumption is that that they need to evacuate everyone immediately. Um, the medical corps, the medical care, the army's not going to take care of these men the way that they would they they would at home. So you have the sanitary commission, the state governors, you have all of these ships that kind of line up and they put men on them and just take them away. And Sherman writes a letter a couple of months after Shiloh, I think to his brother, and says that there are some there were some fifty seven thousand men that were gone and not accounted for wow. and and he's in two months after the war he's like there's still two thousand men we have no idea where they are um and that's kind of this moment of if we cannot figure out one how to care for the men in the field yeah. but also how to keep these civilian organizations out of that yeah. we're not going to be this isn't sustainable right. we can't have 57,000 men just disappearing you know and they're only two years into the war mm -hmm. so so a lot of of what we begin to see in 1862 going into 1863 are are reforms that strengthen the power of the medical corps um, so one of the things that that the new Surgeon General in the spring of 1862 does, uh, William Hammond, um, is that he separates the medical corps from their um, supply base from the quartermasters. Previously, a um, medical officer, if he wanted an ambulance, a wagon, a boat, he'd have to go to the quartermaster. Um, but medical officers, and, and most people don't know, realize this at the time, medical officers have a rank, but at the time they don't have any authority in the military command. 
Mm -hmm. So their orders don't carry any weight. (laughs) So the quartermaster goes, yeah, 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 when I get to it. Meanwhile, you know, you have kind of, you have shortages in medicine. You you can't transport men from point A to point B because that's not what's being privileged. Um, When Hammond separates them, he creates the purveyor and the storekeeper positions, positions within the medical department itself that gives medical directors the complete authority over all of their instruments, all of their transportation, everything kind of kind of like that. Um, and I think what you begin to see is kind of a mutual um, cooperation then that emerges between the medical directors and these high military command. Um, one of the things that, that kind of comes out in my book is that military command still not obligated to follow the orders of medical directors or surgeons and and their recommendations don't fit in line with what the objective is, they'll willingly throw it out. Um, but more often than not, you see this kind of mutual cooperation between the two that kind of manages to, to keep, get these campaigns kind of moving. Hmm. And then before I turn over back to John, do do you find any examples during the Vicksburg campaign in which officers turned to surgeons, turned to doctors and said, I'd like your recommendation or I'd like your advice uh, regarding either the health of the troops or advice about uh, the environment in which uh, the army was inhabiting? Did you Mm -hmm. find any examples like that or are they pretty separate? and if it is, why is that? Why? Because today you wouldn't think, uh, you wouldn't hesitate mm-hmm. to turn to your medical professionals and seek their advice. Oh, wait, yeah. Wait, maybe these days you actually would. I, I, I've overspoken here. We have had some examples of where medical professionals are are sort of discounted. But uh, <laughs> back in the Civil War, do you have any examples at all of that? I, so from what I've seen, the the medical establishments or the medical corps tends to be more reactionary. Um, so instead of kind of that preemptive, this is our command, let's figure out how to do it and keep everyone healthy, um, they'll, they'll go ahead and they'll make their decisions um, and they do it in the middle of, of June, it's hot, it's humid, men start falling out that's when the surgeon tries to get a hold of somebody and be like, I think we need to stop. You know, I think people need a rest. I think, you know, um, and usually sometimes depending on what's going on, it's in those moments that they're like, nope, we got to go. We have to be here at this time. We're, we're moving. You need to figure out how to get everyone to our objective. Hmm. So I never realized until this conversation that, the John Wayne movie, The Horse Soldiers, actually could have happened with his argument between him and his medical surgeon that came along for the ride, literally. Um, that, that's pretty amazing that there's this butting heads. And and mm-hmm. I didn't realize that the, the surgeons held rank, but really didn't hold rank. They didn't hold the power you know, yeah. that they needed. That's an amazing thing to think about because that causes all ki- that would cause all kinds of mayhem. It yeah. had to. Um, we we have a a question in the in the comment section. I'd like to uh, bring up from Andrea. She said those soldiers who were from Shiloh are they considered like absent without leave, as we'd say today? How are they classified? Are they just missing, like Sherman wrote? Uh, so I think at the time Sherman considered them to be AWOL. Sherman considered them to be deserters, um, and I think that that would have been that that the classification. I think he actually, I'm trying to remember the term he uses, I think um, absent without permission or something along those lines. Um, But it's desertion is so kind of amorphous kind of at the time as as these men kind of disappear and and wander their way back and 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 things like that, that it, it doesn't, I haven't seen necessarily a lot of fallout as these men begin to kind of, they track them down and these men begin to kind of trickle back in mm-hmm. to, to the ranks. Mm-hmm. What about, pretty, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, John. Oh, I was going to ask, uh, Lindsay, do you think that another issue concerning, especially in the Vicksburg campaign uh, and, and in summer of 18, or about spring of 1863, going into the summer of 1863, 
do you uh, how do you see the lack of just not only power in the in the surgeon's hands but also just the lack of surgeons and medical personnel that's going on at that time uh how does that impact you know the 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 strength of the armies in that in that period yeah so it seems to hurt them much more that winter so from January to about April, Grant is on the Louisiana side of the river trying to dig, desperately trying to dig a canal so he doesn't have to deal with Vicksburg. Right. Um, and that is where everything just falls apart um, to the point where the medical department actually sends people come to come down and inspect um, the, the operations because rumor has it that things are just people are dying men are dying you know, by the thousands. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where you get a lot of people who are talking about the shortage of, of uh, surgeons. When they make their campaign, and this is one of the remarkable things I think about the campaign itself, is that men's health actually improve. Uh, the Union Army's health improves uh, when they cross the Mississippi River as they're fighting their way to Vicksburg. Um, for a handful of different reasons, but men are kind of given more flexibility to kind of just care for themselves mm -hmm. while they're in the field. Um, and so there's a lot less um, even material where people are talking about surge. C certainly su their surgeons are there. Um, they're trying to kind of take care of the, the men who do get sick. Um, but you notice the shortage of surgeons a, a lot less than they do when they're when they're marching. And then, of course, at the time of the siege for the Union Army, um, you have you have a bit of a shortage uh, during the siege. But Grant has reconnected to his supply base at the river and he's able to send men to Milliken's Bend. Um, and so he has a stable, established medical medical uh, place away from the fighting that kind of then has direct location to hospitals in St. Louis and Memphis. Um, things are much, much different for the Confederates, of course. So they they struggle from, from the get-go and they, um, they really fall victim in the midst of the siege uh, between this squabbling between surgeons and officers where they're fighting over space, they're fighting over cooking instruments, they're fighting over you know, uh, who gets to go to the hospital and who doesn't get to go to the hospital, all sorts of different things. Mm -hmm. So, but, so would, you, uh, would you attribute Grant's success at Vicksburg um, to, that's what I'll give you, it's a multiple choice, right? <laughs> so you gotta pick one. Uh, you're gonna be one. I know what you're gonna try to do. It's just like with the states question. Oh, yeah. I love all the states equal. You're not gonna do that, you gotta pick one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Here we go. A, Grant Superior Generalship. B, okay. John Pemberton was a bumbling fool. C, a medical catastrophe is what doomed the Confederate defense of Vicksburg. A, B, yeah. C, or, yeah. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, not that the first two are not true, but it really, it really turns into a medical catastrophe. And by the time Grant is at the siege, essentially what he is doing is he's playing a giant game of chicken and he's just, I need to keep my army healthy enough to outlast the health of the other army. And as soon as that army collapses, um, and, and that's, that's ultimately what does a few days um, before Pemberton surrenders, he sends a missive out to all of his commanding officers. He's considering one, one assault to try to fight their way out of the city. And he says, can your men do this? And all of them report, they they can barely stand. They can, I think one man says, we might make it out, but they won't make it a mile. You know, so their bodies just physically give out underneath underneath the conditions. Of, that, of, of the siege itself. Of, of the siege itself, yeah. And so throughout the campaign, now going back to the Union Army, you've already made the point that health of the Army seemed to improve over time, and you've already acknowledged that uh, part of that was due to the soldier's self-care. We talked about Katie Shively's book, Nature's Civil War, another UNC book, 
and I just I was turning around looking for it. It's on my shelf here someplace, mm -hmm. and I'll show it in just a moment. Uh, which I think your work, your work, your book uh, certainly re reaffirms that. But I'm, I'm still trying to get a handle on something that gets beyond the caring of, of, of the physical body that a soldier understood in a way that his officers in the medical establishment could not quite grasp. I, I, I think that point's well established. I think you make it very well. But what I'm still grappling with is why is it anyone thinking about the mental and emotional trauma, not just again of combat, but of sustained operations in the field? Or maybe you have found some evidence in which doctors and soldiers are starting to come to terms with, or at least recognize, that there's a emotional and mental toll that life in the field and combat that it that it takes or inflicts. Do you mm -hmm. see anything like that? Or are they are they blind to this? Right? Are they blind to it? So I haven't seen any they're talking about those things explicitly. Um, I do have soldiers who will talk, the, the ones who were in that winter camp trying to dig that canal, right? And then go through the campaign. Um, many of them will say, this was so much better than that. We're so much happier, at least we're doing, you know, so there is kind of a bit of a reflection of, um, an emotional difference of, of these experiences, but connecting those things to the functionality, um, to their health, um, is nothing that's happening explicitly on the, on the ground. Right. I'm going to press you a little bit on this one here. All right. Okay. So what about, we talk about all the time in civil war soldier studies, we talk about the morale, not just of the men, but of those on the home front and mm -hmm. that word morale and how historians have looked at it, it's been almost all-encompassing. It's, it, it's, it's too capacious. It, it can mean very different things to uh, the people we're ascribing to, and I'll, I'll be precise. You know, a soldier who arrives home and is reassuring his loved ones that his spirits are good. Mm -hmm. What does that, does that mean? Does that mean that he's, you know, has sort of a positive outlook uh, about, you know, uh, is mm -hmm. surviving? It, it, does it mean that he has a, a, a an optimistic view of where the war is headed and its outcome? That it was come to a, a successful conclusion. Uh, so morale as a way to uh, evaluate or judge uh, how men are feeling is getting it's, it's very challenging because we as historians have used morale to cover almost anything, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. let's take morale off for a moment. Mm -hmm. Let's go to emotions because mm -hmm. a big part of physical health is emotional health. Yeah. Uh, the men were very aware of that. So, have, and again, maybe this isn't something you've thought about, uh, you know, deeply, but here's your chance, right? <laughs> and that is, so what's, what, what about the emotional health of the men? Do they even write about that? Do they not think about it? Do the officers? What, what's your, your sort of general thoughts about this? Yeah, it, you know, it is something I probably need to spend a little bit more time time thinking about. I did, so as the historian reading everything, I detect moments where their emotional health improves and they tend to tag to moments where the overall health of the army is improving. But I, I'm not I'm not seeing anything saying that specifically in and kind of drawing these connections if that if that makes sense it does it does i yeah. I, I uh I, they're not going to use the word right emotional health or emotional work. right they won't use that but they do identify emotions uh and it was something that i became more i think aware of again in trying to break down what do we mean by morale which is almost always attached to how soldiers see the progress of the war. Mm -hmm. And now, of course, uh, their understanding of their place in the war did not hinge exclusively upon military events. And right. I'm not denying the importance, how critical that is, 
But again, too often we think, oh, what's the morale of Grant's men? Well, it's based upon, you know, how close they think they're getting to the fall of Vicksburg. And certainly that weighed heavily on them. But they did use words. And I think cheerfulness is one of those words. Yeah. And you'll see time and time again. And, and their desire and determination to manage those emotions that's very much connected to their physical health. And Jim Brumall, uh, in his book, I'm, I'm uh, probably a confederate. I think it does a nice job with the emotional issues uh, that soldiers uh, are confronted. Hmm. So, I have, a, I have a few questions here from the, the comment section because I love to bring the, the voice of the people into our comments, <laughs> our, our question. Uh, so, uh, Michelle Donarski, what about the people in the town of Vicksburg? How was their health during the siege? Did they prefer the soldiers to be taken care of? Uh, I guess what she means before them for the mm -hmm. efforts. Yeah. So inside the siege, health health deteriorates for everybody inside the town, but to different extents. So for civilians, of course, one of the same things that begins to happen for civilians during the siege is they begin to dig those caves. Mm -hmm. um, so you have questions of, of issues of sanitation and air ventilation and, and things. But for civilians, most most of what you kind of recorded is issues of uh, malnutrition, starvation, scurvy, and then the health effects that kind of come after not having a lot of food to eat for long periods of time. Um, they, of course, are fighting over access to clean water with uh, soldiers, so they're competing for those resources with soldiers. Um, they'll get very frustrated at the beginning of the the siege before things get really bad when they wake up and find like uh, fruits and vegetables out of their vegetable garden have been raided over the night uh, and, and things like that. Um, in terms of the medical care, you really kind of have two different kind of distinctions. The soldiers are have their um, have the 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 uh, physicians and the surgeons that are kind of taking care of them in the field, and then um, civilians kind of manage their own health amongst amongst themselves. Mm. Of course, as more and more Confederate soldiers kind of begin to get sick, they spill over um, out of the trenches into various hospitals, and then they begin to to just be housed. They're they're just housed in tents. They're housed in houses. Mm -hmm. Um, one of the the Union surgeons riding into the city um, after the fall of the, the siege makes the comment that he had never been in a hospital city before. And, and that's what it was. The entire city had kind of just become one giant hospital. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Lindsay's probably familiar with this. Uh, Mark Smith's, we've, we've talked about Mark Smith's work before on the show. Mm -hmm. uh, Spell of Battle, The Taste of the Siege. Mm -hmm. I think he has an excellent chapter on eating habits, uh, Vicksburg civilians. I think it's really, it's really, really quite good in how their uh, inability as the siege progressed to get food that had a taste to it. Uh, it was more than just suffering, but it was a uh, reminder to them that they were starting to lose uh, their sense of being civilized people. And so mm -hmm. this is again, a, uh, it's a book, uh, it's, a, it's a quick read, but it's an important read. And then before we get to another audience question, I just wanted to show. So I'm sorry why I left the uh, the camera here. Oh, I got a terrible glare. There we go. There you go. Future Civil War again, a UNC book. Um, Catherine Shively Meyer, King King Shively, uh, and uh, that's a book. And it's one that uh, that you know I think is is well worth people's well worth people's time. Oh, God, I think we have some more questions here from the audience. No? Yes, uh, William Gormley. What was the availability of chloroform and other anesthesia at Vicksburg? How did that change? <laughs> yeah, so it would have been prior to the siege, not being in siege conditions. Chloroform and anesthesia, or uh, um, other anesthesia, anesthesia ether, I think was the other big one, would have been very widely acceptable. Um, one of the um, great myths, I think, of the war is that there was a huge shortage all the time of, of chloroform and people regularly underwent surgery having to bite the bullet, um, so to speak. 
Um, and this shortage was not quite as pervasive as I think it's it's always been kind of made out to seem. It certainly grows in the Confederacy over time. Um, so there aren't any massive accounts of shortages in terms of anesthesia or chloroform, especially with the Union Army. Um, they would have been very well supplied um, by the time Grant Grant uh, reestablishes his supply line up at Milliken's Bend. They have easy access to bring in anything he needs. Um, the Confederate Army, of course, as you move further into the siege, that's going to become more and more of a shortage. Um, but the thing to remember kind of about Vicksburg is that the siege itself isn't necessarily a um, conflict of great traumatic injury. Um, it's the disease that really, really um, deteriorates and erodes kind of the strength of the army. Yeah, that's yeah. That's a great. That's a great killing. Mm -hmm. I was just um, at Gabor Bort, uh, my predecessor at CWI, noted Lincoln scholar. He lives um, well as a crow flies, probably two and a half miles max due west of the Longstreet's attack on July second. And on his farm, right, he has the wartime barn uh, that housed the wounded from Sims's Brigade, Georgia Brigade, and Barksdale's Mississippi Brigade. And there were, in fact, uh, men buried all around uh, his farm. Uh, but they found all kinds of relics. And this goes back to Lindsay, to your point, that the myth of soldiers biting on the bullet, uh, which I helped advance, I fear, uh, just this week on a different show I was doing. That there was there are bullets they found near this barn, right? And they're all they got teeth marks in them. But the folks who just do a great job at the medical museum in Frederick. Have you been there yet in Frederick, Maryland? I I went there when I was quite young and I think it had just opened. Uh -huh. And I've not had the privilege of making my way back yet. And I'm quite sad about that. <laughs> That's right. John, John's been interviewed by him uh, yes. before. They, they do a nice job. But they make the point that those bullets that mm -hmm. look like they have bite marks, that they're probably the teeth marks of pigs. Mm. Because as we all know, the pigs love to get into those, uh, get into human flesh. So they're chewing on arms and legs and such. Yeah. And they manage to get themselves on some bullets. So uh, your point overall, I think, is. Is yeah. Really well taken. The other just curious thing, and then we'll go to another question is it, it's, this farm is just so, it's beautiful. It's, it's picturesque. It's, it's fantastic. And again, it's so hard to imagine that it was cramped full of all these men with hideous wounds. But there was a separate room in the main house, in the kitchen, and it was the amputation room. And I thought, you know what? I bet when possible that is likely what happened on most Civil War field hospitals because the thought of you know, cutting off a man's arm or leg in plain sight of all these other men who are seriously wounded and trying to hold on to life. So I expect there were a lot of amputation rooms. You know, for example, I think even at the Spangler Farm at Gettysburg where they're not exactly sure where Lewis Armistead, where they, where he was, you know, basically kept. Uh, there's a number of outbuildings there. I can only imagine that the Federals also use those different buildings. One to sort of house patients and another to do these serious uh, operations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. John, do you have some more questions for us or is that it? I, I actually have uh, something that I would love for Lindsay to touch on before our time does run out. And that is uh, um, we as Americans in, in uh, popular history, we remember when Hurricane Katrina hit, we all learned what levees were. And uh, I, I worked alongside the Corps of Engineers and uh, we, we talked about levees from time to time. And of course there are levees in, in what you have written along the Mississippi River. I, I think it's uh, a pretty interesting point that you make in there about how the levees changed as far as they became uh, a graveyard basically for these men and men would be walking down past the levees and on the interior of the levees would be the burial places. And I think you said that one of the soldiers said it was the Golgotha of America. Mm -hmm. uh, how, you know, that that's so fascinating because we, we talk about, you have a class on memory 
We talk about things uh, involving death, the good death, and and things of that nature. Uh, when you came across those points, knowing that you know over 155 years, some of these levees have been, you know, moved, uh, redirected, etc. How did that? Uh, affect your research when you found out they're just they're putting the men in, in the inside of the levees as well. I mean, you you have to think of how traumatic that that would be is and 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 what you're referring to goes back to that January to April where they're trying to dig that canal and there's no dry ground except for the levees. It's the only thing above water and they're just burying people wherever there's dry ground and then as the area floods. They then have to move their camps onto the same levees that they're burying people in. Right. And just kind of that that sense of no kind of nobility in this death, right? No, no nobility in this burial and this remembering. You're, you're walking over the graves every day. It's getting muddy. It's slicking down um, that I can't imagine what that feels like. And then to wake up one morning and not feel well yourself. Right. And to know that that could be your future. So many miles away from your family, you know, in this in this graveyard. Uh-huh. The, the benefit of the levees is um, most of those soldiers, everyone that they could find, are now buried in Vicksburg National Cemetery. Uh-huh. Wow. So when they go in in 1860, it's 1867 when they go in, they want to they want to build a cemetery in that area for Union soldiers. Um, My understanding is the first effort or the first thought is to put it in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. And uh, someone says, well, no, they died trying to get Vicksburg. Let's put it at Vicksburg. Mm -hmm. Um, And so they go in and they dig out the levees and they get as many soldiers as they can. And I, I think there's somewhere around, if my, my public history memory reminds me right, I think there's 13,000 Civil War Union Union soldiers buried. Um, but I've I always heard rumors. I haven't seen I haven't seen evidence, but I always heard rumors that for several years um, after their their encampment there, that when it rained really hard. And the levees washed out. If you happen to be standing near the river, you could you would ever ever so often see bodies going going down the river. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. These men really were living among the dead, right? I mean, it's yeah, it's truly overwhelming to to think about that. And and your point throughout your uh, your work about the water and the and the awareness of needing to get clean water, but the challenges and sometimes the impossibility of trying to get water that's just not truly putrid. Uh, mm-hmm. Just, again, that daily struggle, that daily grind, that I think, is, you again, Lindsay, you, you make this case so well in your, in, in your work that we're, we're gonna look at military campaigns, if we're gonna understand them, understand the totality of that campaign, that we have to bring in all of its dimensions and, and you bring in uh, this important dimension of the health care of these men and looking at it within an environmental perspective. I mean, you're right there, I think, where some of the best scholarship is, is coming out. So we're certainly very excited uh, for you to work on your, uh, what can I say, revisions? Is that the right word? Expansion? I don't know what you want to call it. But guess what? You know, Lindsay, you have absolutely nothing that's going to compete with your time because you've seen every state in the union there's no <laughs> to do right now yeah. Yeah. the rest of your life you can devote to stay home you've done it all no need to go anywhere else no need to go anywhere. Yeah. I get back to indiana i don't think you sufficiently appreciated the hoosier state i should and probably revisit you should revisit and my mother charlotte carmichael will give you the tour of your life of crown hill cemetery filled with all kinds of civil war historians, but also, you can't miss this one, the gravestone of, let's see, I bet John will know this, famous uh-huh. loser buried in Indianapolis, not Civil War, a gangster. Oh. Hmm. I, all, I can, all I can think of is Dillinger, but I can't You're right, you nailed it. That's what John Dillinger, he was wow. a loser. He was, yeah, he, was, he, was saying, he was a hell of a basketball player and baseball player as well. Wow. Basketball, it's just in our genes. We can't help that. 
Yeah, Johnny Depp didn't do that part in the movie. He did not put another a Johnny Depp like actor, and you're gonna just have to hit like the exit button. Just because I'm gonna keep talking about Indiana. Just yeah. watch our, our our numbers go down. Right? James Dean. James Dean is a famous Hoosier. So it's yeah. kind of, I think Johnny Depp is kind of the descendant of uh, Yeah. Well, Lindsay, you'll have to hit every province in Canada next because uh, where I'm heading, so you got you got to head that direction too. There's a civil war in there. Yeah, yeah, plenty out there as well. But you don't have a gangster like John Dillinger up in Canada. I'm sure I could find a couple. Find <laughs> Someone's running something illegal up there. It'll happen. Hey, Lindsay, thank you so much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And this was really fun. Yeah. yeah. And our last show, Lindsay, or not for a while. We'll come back. We'll be back in August. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, everybody. We'll we'll be back at some some point later this year yeah. uh, as we get settled in to figure out what's going on with our classes in general. All three of us are wondering what's going on and what the world is going to look like in academia in the fall. Uh, and we're all going to have probably three separate experiences in that regard. So we are we are hoping to uh, be back on with you all here in the future, uh, in the fall term, as we would say, and uh, with, with a lot more things to talk about. Uh, we do want to also thank the UNC Press for their continued support of our live streams. Uh, I want to thank Kara for posting uh, the uh, Sean Devine book from UNC Press. Uh, I pinned that if you guys want to get started on that. And then when Lindsay gets hers out, you can get hers and then compare and contrast the two of those. Some of you students can do a book review and get some extra credit. That'd be <laughs> fantastic. But uh, Lindsay, thank you so much for being on this evening and putting up with Pete and I. And, uh, and it's been fantastic to have you on here. Thank you. And Lindsay, I'm going to take a moment here just to, to, to thank John, who was gracious enough uh, for me to uh, be the barnacle to his ship, so to speak. And we, we started this, gosh, it seems like a lifetime ago, but we started in March, did we not, John? And I, I, I believe it was March, yeah. Yeah, and we've probably done, what do you think, pushing 30 shows maybe? Maybe. I'd have to look back and see what all we did, yeah. yeah. They're all going to be on uh, John page, a tattoo historian, as well as the CWI YouTube page, so yeah. people can come and they can see it. But it's been such a pleasure because what I enjoy about working with John is he has um, a real commitment to reaching out and uh, making history accessible. So many different groups of people. And on top of that, he's always trying to bring in different historians who often don't get a platform. In fact, Lindsay, I, we should have mentioned this to you earlier. Just last Saturday, he devoted an entire day to, in essence, was a conference for mm -hmm. students who's, of course, their semester got cut short. And so John was gracious and thoughtful enough uh, to give them that opportunity to be able to share their work with a general audience. And as uh, as we all know, Lindsay, there's a lot of academics who are really good people, but their idea of what we do is that we do scholarship and then it trickles down. That's not how it works. I, I think that's a, a sort of mildly elitist. I think John's a good example. And stuff didn't just trickle down from the academy, right? It also comes from community historians activists, local historians like John. They come together. I think John embodies that. So John, thank you so much. And uh, if we don't have a show before you head off to Canada, I mean, I know you and I will see each other, John, I will. But oh, yeah. people like John in graduate school, as Lindsay can attest to, it's an exciting time. Yeah. It can be a trying time as well, but it's still, it's still, it's all good. Oh, thank you for all that, Pete. That really means a lot. And, uh, and I know that once I get up there, uh, whenever that is, <laughs> and I get settled and I get my internet back up and running, I'm sure we'll be doing something together because I am I would love to have office hours, but you just never know now what's going to be happening. So I'm sure we'll be able to put uh, time together to, uh, to keep doing this because it is all about accessibility and uh, about having a welcoming environment for, uh, you know, historians and history uh, lovers of all kinds to come in and be uh, affected by history in a great way. And that's that's what I've tried to do. That's what I keep trying to do. Uh, and I know there are others who are doing it and I'm very happy to see others uh, lending their voices to trying to make this whole thing more accessible. And uh, I, I wanna 
also, Lindsay's like, I'm, I feel like a third wheel here. But uh, <laughs> but uh, I also want to thank you, Pete, for always, uh, you know, believing in the in the brand. You were the one who met me in the coffee shop. And and the rest is absolute history. You know, <laughs> where I, uh, we uh, we we covered the CWI summer conference last year and hopefully God willing, we'll be doing it next year yeah, and, uh, and we'll be having some good times in the future with the live stream. So absolutely. I really appreciate you believing in it and enjoying it as well. Getting you on here to face technology head on. <laughs> we're going to get, we're going to get Lindsay to CWI and yeah. we're going to see if she can make the transition from the, what some might say is sort of the second theater, which would be the West, of course. See if she can make the transition to the big leagues or get her to do a battlefield tour at Gettysburg. What do you think about that, Lindsay? That could be really fun. Yeah. There you go. We'll, there you go. we'll allow you to make two references to the West when you're out here. Because when you're in Adams County, there's Gettysburg and nothing else. <laughs> yeah. Turning point of the war. Forget Vicksburg. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So, so thank thank you. Take care of thank you our audiences too. Stay healthy, man. Stay yeah. healthy. Wear your mask. Social distance, man. Don't don't yeah. be silly about this stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah. Just just like the Union Army, listen to the medical professionals. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all so much for tuning in every single week uh to each episode. Or thank you for tuning in to this one. If this was your first, we really appreciate it. Thank you for the comments, the questions. Please don't forget to go support UNC Press. They've been a great partner in crime with this with us. And we can't wait to be back on with you here in the future to talk more Civil War history. So thanks, everybody. Take care and be safe. Bye.